that had to be a very humbling moment for dad, don't you think? I mean, my goodness, it's your son. Before we dive into the sermon this morning, um, I'd just like to say, I appreciated the song selection this morning. Desperation, it is well with my soul. I want God's grace to flow down. After everything that we witnessed this week, those are words that we need to remember. We need to be desperate for our relationship with God. So let me set the scene of what you just watched. Remember last week, Josh, we, we witnessed Josh's first game. And, well, um, Mom comes home and tells Dad that he's got, he's got a chess player in the family. And, well, Dad is unconvinced of Josh's ability. So he goes to the closet, and he pulls out an old chess board, and he brings it to Josh, and he says, let's play a game. And, well, Josh wants to go get pizza. But Dad says, well, we have to play the game first. So they play a game, and um, Josh's dad defeats Josh very easily the very first time. And that's where our clip picks up, because Mom tells Dad, he lets you in. Trust me, Josh can beat you. So Josh decides, Josh's dad decides, okay, we're going to play one more, and I really, really, really want you to try. And when he dropped those books on the floor and they came down with that piano, did you not see the look on Dad's face? Oh my gosh, things just got serious. And he sat down in the chair and he pulled it up and he looks at dad and he says, you know what? It's your move. And that's where our clip kind of runs. Now, I want you to think about something for just a minute. Remember back to the clip. Hopefully you're paying attention. What does Josh say he's doing when he was on the phone? And his friend obviously asked him if he could come out to play. And Josh said he couldn't because what? He's playing chess with his dad. Now think about the clip. What was Josh really doing? Well, he was playing mousetrap with his sister. He was stacking cereal boxes, the little bitty cereal boxes in the, in the, in the kitchen. While he was talking on the phone, later he was taking a bath while he was playing with the ball, and Dad is sitting there at the chessboard laboring over every single move, and Josh is just running back and forth, making moves, it seems, effortlessly. And, you know, he wins the game because, honestly, he's just better than Dad. He sees the board better. He understands the game better. But... When he gets into real competition, where the opponents know as much as you do, if not even more, then this idea of running around while you're doing all the other things and still trying to win a chess game, it's not going to work. Josh is going to have to learn some discipline. Josh is going to have to learn how to be still. And this is exactly where we are this year on purpose. And you know what? I watched the news just like everybody else this week. I watched the post and I watched the articles and I watched what was going on and I heard the opinions. And as I listened to it all, I thought, you know what? Point proven. We have become a people, a society, a culture, we can call it a world. We have become a world where we absolutely positively react to everything. And the reaction causes a reaction, which causes another reaction, which causes another reaction. And we spend our days just reacting to one another, and we never stop to look at the board and look at where the pieces are, and we never stop to think, be still. God? What are you doing during this time? God, I'm, I'm looking at where you put the pieces. Lord, what should my next move be? We never take the time to study what's going on. We're kind of like Josh was with that game. We're just running back and forth and just moving the pieces because we think we know where God wants us to be. And God tells us, you know what? Be still and know that I'm God. 
So to be still definitely takes some disciplines, and so that's where we're starting our year out. And last week we talked about the discipline of solitude, and this week we're going to talk about a discipline that I am not very good at. It's called the discipline of rest. How many people here are tired? I'm good at that one. I'll I'll run myself ragged until my tank is empty, and I am tired. But I have a deficiency in me, and I like to call it OCD, and maybe it's something even worse. I can be tired, but if I'm sitting there, and there's something that still needs to be done, whether it be a piece of trash on the floor, or whether it be, I can't sit still and rest. And you know what? That's a problem. The inability to rest is a problem. Rest is defined, and when you look it up in the dictionary, you actually get three verses. Now, i got to warn you. You're going to have to write fast, because you got a lot of blanks, and you're probably not going to get them all filled in before I I finish, because you know what? You don't have time to rest. You need to write if you're going to fill in the blanks. But what I don't want you to do is get so busy filling in the blanks that you don't listen to what's going on. Pay attention to the board. So rest is a cease work or movement in order to relax, refresh oneself, or recover strength. Rest is an instance or a period of relaxing or ceasing to engage in strenuous or stressful activity. And believe it or not, rest, and this one actually seems like maybe I should have just left this one off, but it really fits to our sermon very well. In music, an interval of silence of a specified duration. So that's what rest is. And psychologically and physically and mentally and emotionally, let's forget about the spiritual. Let's just kind of do a self-help for a moment. What do I get out of the ability to rest? Here we go. What does rest do for me? Whoops. <laughs> Kayla? <laughs> Kayla, I think you hit something. Hit. Start the slideshow back. <laughs> just start it back. I'll have to get down to it. You hit something. Start it again. There you go. I'll get, start again. There you go. Leave it right there. All right, here we go. The worship team's used to doing this. All right, fill those blanks in quickly. Here we go. All right. There we go. Benefit of rest. Hopefully I didn't do something wrong. All right. So it reduces stress. It reduces inflammation and it, the risk of heart disease. It boosts your immune system. That's what rest does. Man, don't we all want that one these days? Rest, taking a regular time away from work, restores your mental energy. So rest gives you focus. Rest improves your short-term memory. So if you have a forgetful problem, odds are you have a rest issue. You just aren't learning how to rest. Here's one. Rest makes you more creative. That's important. And for all of those who at your New Year's resolution is you're going to lose a little weight, guess what? Rest lowers your weight gain risk. The more rested your body is, the easier, easier time it has to metabolize food. As a matter of fact, if you're tired, do you know your body is 30% less efficient at digesting food when you're tired? When it is less efficient at digesting food, it does one of two things. It either stores it for later, and guess where it stores it? Yeah, we call that fat. Or it says, I can't deal with processing it right now, so it disposes of it, which means you're hungry again quicker, which means you eat more. Man, this whole thing about rest, this sounds like something maybe I really want to learn. Let's just forget about church for a second. Let's just forget about the spiritual. Let's just talk about my life in general. How much better would my life be if, I could rest. I'd have less stress. I'd be thinner. I'd be healthier. What's wrong with rest? What's wrong with me? Why can't I rest? Now, here's a thought that I want you to take into it, because many of us, myself included, can be a little bit of a workaholic. There's things to do, things you got to get done. And so God tells us this in Psalm chapter 127, verse 2. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for the food to eat, for he grants sleep to those 
he loves. I thought about that verse, and sometimes I must not be very loved because I don't sleep very well. But then I begin to think about it. God created this thing called daytime and nighttime. You know, the time when the sun is up and then the sun goes down. And he created a cycle, a 24-hour cycle. You know, that's how long the earth takes to make a rotation. And he created all of this so that I would have a clock and I would understand there is a time when God has granted me to rest. But you know what he is not going to do? He is not going to go get the handcuffs and handcuff me to the bed and make me go to sleep. He's not going to give me some kind of official little spiritual night tall, night, night, night tablet to make me go to God says you have to be willing to take advantage of the idea of rest. I love what John Ortberg says in his book, The Life You Always Wanted. He calls it the spiritual discipline of taking a nap. And you know what? I am lousy at naps. I am. Matter of fact, if I start taking a nap, my family probably, is he breathing? Is he still there? Is he with us still? Because I don't do naps. I don't even sleep in a car well. This idea of rest sometimes is just a little bit beyond me. So this is a good sermon for me to preach because I need to learn this discipline myself. But you know what? I know most of you. And you're not very good at this either. We jam our days so full of things to do that we don't know how to rest. So we need to realize all the way back at the beginning, all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, God set the example for this idea of rest. This is what it says. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, He rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating creating that he had done. So this always brings up a very interesting question because we know the story of creation and God spoke and it happened. I don't know what it looked like. I don't know if things went bang. I don't know if they just materialized. I don't know if it looked like Star Trek where things kind of just energized and there it was as it came in. I don't know what it looked like, but I know what God was doing was God spoke, and then it happened. And he took six days to do this, and so the question we always ask ourselves is, did God need to rest? And I know what they told me in Sunday school growing up for all those years, but I just want to tell you, they gave me the wrong answer. Because yes, absolutely. God needed to rest. How do I know God needed to rest? Here it is, because he did. God doesn't do anything he doesn't need to do. Now, I don't believe he was like, oh my gosh, I'm so worn out. I mean, making all of these things has made me tired. I just, I've worked up a sweat. I need to go take a hot bath and sit down with some popcorn and just kind of relax for a minute. Man, do you know how hard it was putting together those bees and getting those wings off? I don't think he rested because he was tired. I think he rested because he needed a moment to sit back and take a reflection on what's going on. Because when we rest, rest is not about getting over, it's not about getting over being tired. Rest is all about reflecting on what just happened. When I am resting, when I am getting to that point that I am resting, then it gives me the chance to begin to focus on what's coming next. Remember that music definition we had? Think about what it would look like for those that play instruments, especially if you play one of the ones that you blow in, If there was no rest in the music, what would you get? Well, for those that are blowing on something, it would be called oxygen asphyxiation because you'd be putting out more than you'd be taking in, and eventually you'd just pass out halfway through the music. Wouldn't that be an interesting sight of the band concert? For the percussions and all the other pieces out there, that moment of rest is for you to take that moment and say, okay, that measure is done. These are the next notes that I have to get to, and it gives you a chance to find your place. I understand, well, I can't play an instrument. I get the idea. Rest is not just about taking a breath. Rest is also about 
where am I going to go next? It gives me that moment of pause instead of running into the next thing without a plan and begin to say, I see the board. I see what you've done. I see what's going to happen next. And you know what? I am absolutely, positively ready for rest. Now here's the thing. If you're waiting for yourself to get tired before you rest, think about your body for a minute. When you become thirsty, we all know thirsty, and what do we usually go looking for when we're thirsty? Something to drink. Hopefully water. Do you know by the time that you're thirsty, your body is already de- dehydrated? As a matter of fact, the, not, the, the, the acknowledgement of thirst is because now your brain has gotten to the point and all the cells in your body are crying out and screaming out, we need water. And so the brain finally sets it off in your mouth to say, okay, we're going to make you thirsty. That way you have the sensation to go get something. But, but your body has already started to dehydrate. You know, rest works the same way. If you are unable to rest until you are dead tired, then you get it, right? You have ran your battery down to the point that if you don't rest, you're going to collapse. And that's not the way God wants us to rest. Because then we have this cycle that we go through. We rest, and then we go in until we collapse. And then we rest, and we get just enough, to go, and we keep going. And what you're going to find is your intervals begin to squish. See, God has this idea that he wants us to have a structured rest idea in our life. And so guess what? Because of that, God commanded rest all the way back in Exodus, handing out those 10 basic rules of how you're supposed to go about having a relationship with God. This is what he says in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. And I'm sure you know this if you've been at church for any length of time. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter. My kids are like, yes. Nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any of the foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. We all learned this when we were like kids, if you're growing up in church. You know, the Ten Commandments. We did that here at, the, at our church. They had the Ten Commandment boogie. And you want to understand the idea that in the middle of all these commandments, God says, I command you to take a day of rest. Now, think about who he's talking about and talking to in that moment. God is talking to a bunch of former slaves. Isn't that what the Israelites have been doing? They had been living in a culture, in a pagan culture, that considered them expendable property. So remember, they were the ones that were making the bricks, and they were the ones that, that were helping get the, temp, the, get the pyramids built. They were the ones doing a lot of the manual labor, and they were expendable property, because if I run one to death, who cares? I'll just throw that one out and go get another one. They weren't considered people. They were property. And because of that, they probably had not had a day off in 400 years. I hate to tell you this, when you're a slave, they don't usually set a clock. Okay? They don't have a, well, you go in at this time and you get off at this time. They don't have scheduled lunch breaks or meal breaks like we're supposed to get because of the way they they do laws in our country. They didn't have any of that. Basically, they literally worked you till you died. And if they... Where were you out too early? It's okay. You're just a piece of property. We'll go get another. So I want you to think about this. So here's Moses, and he's got these Ten Commandments, and he's reading them out one at a time, and he gets to this one, and he looks at the audience, and he says, you're supposed to take a day off once a week. I got a feeling he had such a cheer come from that crowd. We get a whole day? Really? You want me to take a day and do absolutely, positively nothing? Just sit 
and rest. I bet you Moses was the most popular guy on, around that day because he had just given them something they had never had. But think about the generation that we live in. When we bring that law across thousands of years and now we set that command down here and we talk to our generation, our generation looks at it and you know what? We are driven mortal people. Everybody here understands that, right? Unless Jesus comes back early, everybody has an expiration date. Eventually, everybody dies at some point. And so we realize our days are numbered. So since my days are numbered, we want to make the most out of the time we've got. Don't we? I mean, I get 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But how many years do I get? I don't know. I might get one more. I might get, heaven forbid, I get 50 more. I'm, I'm, I mean, I've got things I've got to get accomplished in my life. And so I want to get everything crammed into what God has given me. And so you know what goes out the door first. I don't need a day to rest. I, I, I just need a couple of hours here and there, right? Just, just a moment to catch my breath for just a second. Just that little brief instance. I, I don't need this one, God. And we live our lives for the experience. And that forces us to set aside this discipline. Tell me you don't do it. I'm guilty. I mean, yesterday was Saturday. Now, Sabbath meant seventh, and so they observed the, sab the, sab the Sabbath on the seventh day. Do you know what my day lo lo looked like yesterday? I spent my Sabbath painting a closet and a ceiling, and we're having to get some renovations, not by our own choice, done at our house. Um, that's another story for another day, but, but it's caused a lot of stress and busyness in my house. And you know what the funny thing is? The busyness in my house was then also put in the idea that I still have things to do at the church, and I still have things to do at, at my job, and I still have kids, and I still have a wife, and I still have all this other stuff. And so what don't I have time for? I don't have time to rest. God, i got too much to do. Are you kidding me? Have you seen my schedule, Lord? You messed up when you came about with this one. And so we live our life for the experience in the moment, and we began to cut out this idea of the day of rest. Now, before you get too hung up on the Sabbath, I want you to take a look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. Because you know what? It's not about the day. It's about a mentality. Listen to this. Therefore, since I still remain for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again said a certain day called it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David as a passage, as a passage already quoted. Today, if you hear his voice and do not harden your hearts, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then the Sabbath rest. So we're not now talking about a day. We're talking about a day amongst seven days. A Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works. So this is not just about being spiritually rested. This is about physical rest. And he says, and by the way, look at the example just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter, in, enter that rest so that no one will perish but following the example, by following the example of disobedience. So I told you yesterday was Saturday. Today is Sunday. Do you know what my schedule looks like today? It ain't much better. Ain't amazing things going to happen. You know what happens after Sunday. We had this thing called Monday. And, and just so you know, that was not going to get any better either. And Monday's followed by Tuesday. And, well, there's an elders meeting Tuesday night, and I still got all the other things. So, so that one's not a good day. And, and Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, no, there, there are no days. God, what are you talking about? You get what God's saying here, right? Rest does not happen 
Rest is a skill you must learn. If you're waiting for a day off, and I'm guilty of this, you're never going to find it unless you decide to make room for it. If you're waiting for that moment of rest, nobody's writing the music of your story for you, and they're just going to put a pause in there for you. You've got to choose to make one. Now, I find it very interesting that um, the Hebrew writer mentions David and Joshua together in the scripture. You know why? Because David and Joshua were both men of great worship. We know David, the man after God's own heart, the man that danced out in the streets in his underwear because he wanted to worship God. And we know Joshua was the man that looked at everybody else and said, you guys can live your life any way that you want, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. They were both men that had a great heart for worship. But you also understand they were both men of war. David was the mighty king that expanded the Jerusalem empire well beyond this border. David was a warrior. As a matter of fact, he was such a good warrior, God wouldn't even let him build a temple for him because he had all the blood on his hands. Joshua was the leader when Israel took the land. They were both men of war. You know what's so funny about that? War doesn't have a schedule. I mean, it's not like you can call across the field and say, hey, you over there that's shooting at me, you can't shoot today. It's my day of rest. I'm off. It doesn't work that way, does it? You, you can't look at somebody in the middle of a war and say, okay, time out, time out. Okay, I'm, I'm signaling you have to stop because I need a moment to take a breath. But even amongst these men who were men of war, God used them and said, you know what? They still had to learn this idea of rest. And he tells them, pick a moment. Seriously. Pick a moment. Find a spot in your life and, and, and pick a moment and shut it down. I, I'm learning how to do this. Okay, I don't know how to do this. I'm working on this. This is a skill that I need, the ability to just shut it down. Be still. Know that I'm God and rest. And you're probably thinking, I don't have time. Listen to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore... Since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found having fallen short of it. So when we went from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we no longer observe Sabbath. Okay, my house doesn't observe Sabbath. Maybe you do. Maybe yesterday you got up and, and, and you took maybe less than 40 paces from where you are to sitting in your chair and you sat there all day long yesterday and you stared at the wall and you used that day to, maybe that's you. My life doesn't work that way. And so this idea of taking a moment of rest, we kind of skew it in the New Testament. You know what we usually call our moment of rest? Here on Sunday mornings. So, so think about what we're, doing, what we're doing, okay? Really think about it for a second especially if you're online. So you get up on Sunday morning, and we're going to start about 10.30-ish, okay? So, so maybe you come crawling out the bed around 8 o'clock, maybe 8.30, maybe 9 if you really live close and you're a fast dresser and you don't eat breakfast. And, and, so, and so you get here, and you get here about 10.30, and then you get into your seat you know, after you get your communion cup and you get where you're supposed to be, and you get in your seat, and the moment you sit down, we have you stand up. And we pray. And then we have you sit down and you do communion. And then we go up and, and, and we sing. And then we listen to a sermon. And then you go home. And then you start the rest of your day, which usually is not about resting. What's it about? Oh, ball games, things to clean, things to do. It's that day I catch up to get ready for the next week. Is this not your life's? It's mine. And so I call this my moment of rest, but this is like Josh's chess game. Running around, do this, that, and the other. So this is not the moment of rest. But God still says, 
I command you to take one. As a matter of fact, he used this word if you choose not to rest. He called it disobedience. He called not resting a sin. <gasps> okay, I'm a sinner, big time when it comes to this one. But I've never thought about it this way. If I choose not to rest, I am disobeying the command that God gave us. The command that A, is good for my body, B, is good for my soul, and C, is good for my emotions. We sing those songs about desperate, it is well with my soul. I think a lot of times it's not well with my soul because my soul is tired. And so God says, take a rest. Take a break. Name of that first song, what is it? Breathe. Be still. And know that I'm God. And if you choose not to do it, God says, guess what? Just like every other sin, when you choose not to rest, there are consequences. Now, I read some of those things that rest does, to, does for you. You realize the absence of rest does the other. It causes you to gain weight. It puts stress in your life. It can lead to more heart disease. It leads to the fact that your body, when it's tired, doesn't produce white blood cells at the same pace. Therefore, it makes you the ability to get sick even worse. So, so there are some immediate consequences, but in the verses that I read, it says that you will perish by following the example of disobedience. So that means that not only am I not resting, you know what I'm teaching my kids? Put that thing in overdrive, and push that pedal to the metal, and you go as hard as you can until you get to the end of your life. And you know what that means my kids don't have time to do? Be still and build their own relationship with God. Because they're following whose example? My, you know whose example I'm following? My dad's. And I'm sure he followed his dad's, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we've propagated this down, and as our society has sped up with the information flow, now we're to the point that we're so tired, and there's so much information to react to, that I just keep reacting to it all. And I react badly. Because you know what? I haven't rested. I'm tired. And my kids will tell you, when I'm tired, you know what I get? They have a word for it. It starts with a G, it ends with a Y called grumpy okay that's when my kids like you're grumpy and they, they understand I'm at the end of my tank and unfortunately that's usually when I choose to rest when the tank is all done but here's the discipline don't wait because if you wait until you're tired to rest what do you do with your rest time you sleep right what does God want you to do with your rest time he wants you to have enough of it where you can get your physical sleep but also have some time to focus on the board, to focus on what's going on in your life, to focus on this idea of be still. And then know that I'm God. That might mean you have to go lock yourself in a room. I don't know, you might have to like put up like a fence or something to keep people away. I don't know how you do it. I'm, I'm looking for it. But I understand it. God wants us to be still and know that he's God. And if we're going to do that, then we're going to have to find a way to rest. Take a moment. Breathe. Let your soul refresh. And be still. And know that I am God. And until we take that moment of rest, Satan is going to keep pounding the board. He's going to keep your focus exactly where that you don't have time, because if you take time you to rest, you realize what's going to happen to that board. You're going to lose control of it. Be still. Take a day. Take a moment. Set aside the time. Force yourself to set aside the time to rest. And take a moment to let God